Hey there Bruce, welcome back to Remember 11, I was going to say Ever 17, Remember 11, Age of Infinity, we are reviewing the footage of the security cameras in Sphere, in the hopes that we're going to figure out, basically if Kokoro is the one who's trying to murder us, which sounds strange, but I don't know, it could happen. Anyway, Friday, January 13th, I recall that things are relatively calm on that day, and by relatively I mean compared to the other days. My body didn't experience any threats to its life, nor did anyone attack anyone else. Therefore, there weren't any need, wasn't any need to double check the files for the 13th. I skipped over that day and moved to the 14th. January 14th, Saturday. That was the day that I met Inamoto in, Naoya. You don't know what she did in your body though, you still should have checked for that day as well. I listened to him talk about the space-time transfer and then he nearly killed me. However, I transferred again, the moment before it happened, and once I returned, it was Inamoto who lay dead, not me. Nothing that occurred prior to that moment was very important, just what had happened down in the basement storeroom. That was the only thing that bothered me. I extracted the scene of my struggle with Inamoto and played it back. Time, 6.11pm. Location, basement storeroom. Darkness. A black screen. But unlike the earthquake several days ago, this time the data itself had been properly recorded. The emergency lights illuminated the area. Within the dimness on screen, I saw human shadows writhe, but because of that, I couldn't tell what was happening. Again. I raised the brightness of the footage and increased the color saturation and tone at the same time, which raised the contrast considerably. That did it. The contours of the objects on screen became fantastically clear. Only the surfaces that the light managed to hit stood out, but I had no trouble distinguishing the human figures in the image. The display showed Inamoto and me grappling with each other hand to hand. Inamoto was straddling my body, pressing hard on my nose and mouth with both hands. I had no memory of this. In other words, the transfer had already occurred by this time. My body struggled violently, thrashing its arms and legs, and caught Inamoto on the chin with a strong right hook. Inamoto staggered. My body seized that chance to escape Inamoto's hold. After that, a long fight and so flight ensued. With Kokoro's consciousness controlling it, my body left the building once and re-entered through the window of my room. It rushed over to the door and then suddenly looked up, as though surprised. Timidly, it left the room, passed through the dining area, and then once again descended the stairs to the basement storeroom. As though he'd been waiting for me, Inamoto's hand shot out and made contact with my shoulder. My body fell. Inamoto sprang after it. His hand still grasped the palely glinting knife. Inamoto inverted the knife and swung it down right at my throat. At that moment, Inamoto disappeared from the screen. For a moment, I didn't know what was happening. I rewound, then played the video back in slow motion. When I did, I saw Hitori tear across the screen with the speed of a gale taking down Inamoto with a perfectly aimed body blow. Why did Hitori do that? That wasn't the first time I'd seen this image, but I still f couldn't help but stare at it in shock. Kokoro and I had been saved by Hitori. I hadn't heard a peep out of either Kokoro or Hitori to that effect. As I thought that, the events on screen were still rushing by. I returned the playback setting to normal speed and fixed my eyes on the screen. Inamoto got to his feet and stared into the darkness. He appeared to be frantically searching for something. Looking closely, I could tell that the knife had disappeared from his hand. He must have dropped it the moment he fell. That knife was now in my hand. My left hand. It was my left hand that gripped the knife. Inamoto shook his head in disbelief as he continued to survey the occluding darkness. On faltering steps, my body rushed toward him from behind. It didn't make any attempt to conceal itself, but neither did it scream out or make any other threatening movements. It was almost like a kitten. A kitten that reacted to anything that moved, jumping around innocently and finally pouncing. The sound of footsteps seemed to have finally reached Inamoto's ears as he suddenly turned around. My body aimed for his chest and rushed forward to cling to it. Just like a kitten frolicking, playfully. Their two bodies overlapped as they flew through the air, drawing a slow parabola in their fall. Right after that, the display went white. The picture had jumped because the brightness was too high. I cleared all the adjustments I made to the footage, then rewound a bit, rewound it a bit and played it back again. From the ceiling of the dim st storeroom, after flickering several times, the lights came back on and flooded the room. Yuni was the one responsible for that. Lowering his finger from the switch, he turned around and gulped. He pressed a hand over his mouth, his eyes as round as saucers, as ex an expression of terror. Following the direction of Yuni's stare, I saw Inamoto's bloody corpse crumpled on the floor. Yesterday, Yuni had said to me, this goes way beyond just thinking. I saw you with my own eyes. You were laughing as you stabbed that man over and over and over. Even you must have known he was already dead, but you kept on stabbing him. You butchered his corpse acting like it was a game to you, didn't you? 
It didn't happen. As if to verify Yuni's words, the screen all too clearly showed an image of me toying with the corpse. I'm laughing. It's true. Straddling Inamoto, I slashed him over and over again with the knife. I gripped in both hands, digging chunks of flesh from his chest, piercing right through his belly. As if scribbling randomly on a piece of paper, I ran the knife all over his body. Soundlessly, the knife was drawn into the lifeless slab of meat. With a foolish smile of utter ecstasy on my face, I was wholeheartedly enjoying the sensation of the knife sinking into the meat. Inamoto was still, his clouded eyes fixed on the empty air above him. With every thrust of my knife, more blood foamed out of his mouth and nostrils and ran off into the floor. I endlessly persisted in this terrible game, doing it over and over and over again. I continued moving my hands across the cold slab of meat, never resting for a moment. No, that's not it. I suddenly shook my own head as I came to my senses. The person being projected here wasn't me. It was Fuyukawa Kokoro. However, after having seen it so plainly, I could no longer think of it as just an illusion. What if the one who killed Inamoto wasn't Kokoro, but actually me? Had I completely lost myself without even realising it, and fallen into such a level of barbarism? In reality, the person there on screen couldn't be anyone but me. Using common sense, the most obvious explanation for this gruesome murder was that I was the culprit. But that's wrong. I unconsciously looked away. This isn't me. It isn't me, it isn't me. I muttered those words again and again, trying to convince myself. By the time I lifted my head back up, the next scene had begun to unfold. My body got up from Inamoto. I st it stared at the blood-drenched knife as though it was something mysterious. Right there next to it was Hattori. She was crouching in the puddle of blood, splashing around playfully in it. The blood flew up as she sp as splashes and fell back down as a red rain. The falling raindrops disappeared back into the puddle, creating ripples before they vanished. As she watched them, Hattori's face broke into a huge gleeful smile. She was laughing again. This had already exceeded the limits of my understanding. I shuddered violently as though suddenly cold. It was madness. If this wasn't an act committed by a madman, then what was it? I couldn't believe that a human was capable of this. The beings on screen were just a pair of demons who'd assumed human form and were amusing themselves for a little, with, little while with this. I couldn't see it any other way. Time, 7.17pm. Location, basement storeroom. On screen, I suddenly raised my head and looked around the room. I noticed the knife on my left hand. An expression of shock and deep disturbance came to my face. On top of that, the body of Inamoto lying in front of me had undergone a drastic change. As I saw it, every muscle in my jaw stiffened and then began twitching convulsively. I placed my hand against my chest in an attempt to return my breathing to normal. Yes, a clear and obvious chance. A transfer, a space-time transfer had occurred. I could clearly remember these events. For a while, the me on screen stood staring at the corpse, immobile as a cast-off shell of my actual self. The corner of the screen contained a digital timestamp. The indicator for seconds was still moving, but besides that, everything was still. And then, 7.31pm, a black shadow crossed the screen. Determined to catch it and reveal its true identity, this time, I tried viewing the footage from another angle. What I saw projected there was Hattori, now dyed the vivid red of fresh blood. She toyed with the knife she held in both hands. She'd stolen it from me. Hattori was facing me, and we were having a conversation. Only her lips moved in the silence of, that, of the frame. Hey Satoru, which do you prefer? Hey, which one? I mean, to stab or to be stabbed? Which do you prefer? I couldn't hear her voice, but I remember those words all too well. If I remember correctly, my consciousness should jump into the shelter cabin right after this. And just as expected, there was a change in the footage. Time, 7.34pm. Location, basement storeroom. I saw my body react, giving a quick shiver. It had been just 17 minutes before, shock and disturbance registered on its face. When it noticed Hinamoto's dead body, it covered its mouth with its hand as though fighting back nausea. Something startled it, and it raised its head. Hattori was standing right before its eyes. Hattori's eyes were blank. She blinked several times as though playing dumb. Eventually, she noticed the abnormality and looked down at her own body and at the knife in her hands. Confused, Hattori let go of the knife. She was frightened as if she couldn't understand what she'd just done. The pallor that came over her face spelled it out clearly. She took her head and shook her head a number of times as though to deny it. As though begging for help, she reached her hand out to my body and began to draw nearer to it. The one there, on the screen right now, wasn't the Hattori I knew. The Hattori who spoke those suspicious words while idly toying with the knife, and the Hattori desperately seeking help, with their face warped in fear. The two of them were clearly different people. The shadow of Inabushi Kaiko immediately rose in my mind. One is Inabushi and the other is Hattori. Is that how it was? On top of that, the timing of her personality change lined up with that of the space-time transfers. It can't be. A suffocating uneasiness came overcame me. 
I'd reached one conclusion, but it was still too soon. There wasn't enough evidence yet. Just now Itsumi was joining them on screen, and the scene soon turned into a brawl. Hattori began running amok. My body cried out while it still did its best to hold her back. Itsumi brandished the knife and with her face of a demon she attacked. Yuni was crouched nearby with blood flowing from a wound to his forehead. I'd, re I'd reached my limit. Forcing myself to look straight ahead, I firmly closed the file as if to erase it. The behaviour of lunatics who'd cut, their own hum cut out their own human hearts had shaken me to my very core. A sombre air seemed to surround me. Unable to stand it, I stood up from the console and began walking around the dimly lit room. There was a coffee maker in the corner. Hoping for a change of pace, I swiftly made some coffee. I poured it into a cup and gulped it down. It was completely tasteless to me. But it might have felt that way just because the cup was the same one Inamoto would use. Even so, I was somehow able to calm myself down. I placed the empty cup on top of the console and pulled up the last of the recordings. The files from January 15th. I'd already seen everything in here once, but it was certainly possible that I'd overlooked something. I couldn't leave without making sure. After all, this is the day I drank the DMT and the MAO inhibitor. Jan Sunday, January 15th. Time, 7.43am. Location, dining area. When I asked her about the DMT and the MAO inhibitor, Hattori said that maybe I'd drunk it myself. And just as she said that, the recording showed that as well. When my body began to doze off, it wandered into the dining area rubbing its eyes. Its steps were shaky, like a sleepwalker's. Its body wavered to the left and to the right, just barely managing to reach the table. There were two bottles just under the table. The bottles containing the DMT and the MAO inhibitor. My body picked up the bottles, staring at them with great interest. And then, I have no idea what it was thinking, but it suddenly drained the contents of both bottles in a few great gulps, without anyone forcing it or leading it on. My body drank both bottles of medicine on its own, without the slightest apparent hesitation. I couldn't think of its actions as anything but a gravely foolish snap decision. The effects of the drugs immediately began to show. And just one minute after that, my body fell to its knees, then dropped heavily to the floor, its head slowly bowing like an ear of rice. My forehead went to the floor, my arms were thrown out haphazardly to either side. The next transfer probably occurred right after this. There was no mistake. My memory from the 15th began with me lying like this after all. Afterward, trying to get up after the transfer, still helpless to move, I fell face up and lay there immobile. The one who nursed me back to health was Itsumi. Itsumi carried me to my room and administered an antidote to counteract the drug. From then till afternoon, I lay on my own bed, sound asleep. And there ends my analysis. There were many mysteries still remaining, but for now, let's summarize everything I'd gathered. Kokoro's nuts. How did I almost drown in the bathtub? It was my body's fault. My body took those sleeping pills on its own volition and entered the bathroom. Nobody actually plunged my unconscious body into the bathtub. Hattori turned out to be responsible for the door slam that I heard, but she was unrelated to the incident. She never took a single step into the bathroom. Same goes to everyone else. At the time in question, only my body was in the room. If I had to accuse someone of trying to drown me, then the only candidate was myself. Next, who killed Inamoto? No need to repeat this ad nor I don't know what just happened there, sorry. No need to repeat this ad nauseum. Every particular of the massacre was recorded on a video. It was my body. Lastly, why did my body ingest the DMT and MAO inhibitor? No need to explain this either. My body was the culprit once again. Other people had absolutely nothing to do with it. Those are the three points I proved anew. Proved isn't quite the correct word, I should probably say that I confirmed my speculations. My body was responsible for everything, in a way I had almost expected it. There were no cameras set on the rooftop, and so I couldn't find anything out about the incident on the clock tower. The same could be said about the wound on my left arm, no data was saved during that time. But my other findings were more than enough. From the information I unearthed, I found the answer. So to summarise, the criminal out to kill me is... Well, look, two options. It can't be Kokoro, though. Kokoro. Kokoro's consciousness tried to injure my body. That's the only possibility I can think of. After all, while I'm cut off from my own body, she's the one controlling it. I don't know her motives. As Hattori said, maybe she really is suicidal. And judging from the way she murdered Inamoto, I think one of her screws came loose. A crime during that mo during a moment of fitful insanity. Anyway, it was Kokoro's consciousness all along. The records tell me everything. It's sad, but I have to face up to it. I won't waver anymore. I won't let myself be restrained by feelings and obligations any longer. I closed my eyes, took a heavy breath, and let that left that musty room. 
I guess we'll find out if we're right, because we'll die if we're wrong. The next transfer was at 4.48am. I still had over 30 minutes left, but I couldn't afford to relax. I didn't know what was going to happen, so I snapped into action. Returning to my room at once, I took the coat from my closet and quickly left. The sky was still dark. The clear midwinter sky had countless numbers of stars scattered across it. The moon was hanging low in its last phase in the south southeastern direction. It was miss, missing more of its own light now, drawing a mere semicircle as if torn in two. A half moon. The one that's there, yet the one that isn't. I pushed forward into the darkness, relying only on the light of the moon and the stars. I was standing by the front gate. On the left was a computer terminal with a lock controlled by a card reader. I took my ID card from my pocket and slid it through the slot. Or at least I tried to slide it, however... The card wouldn't go in. Looking closely, I saw the card slot and frozen over. Damn it, how could it get stuck at a time like this? There hadn't been any snowfall at Alsagi Island over the past few hours. But what about Mount Akakuta? From the magazine article, I knew that Mount Akakuta was hit by a blizzard on the 15th. And it wasn't as if Sphere had always been stuck in Alsagi Island. Sphere had been exposed to the snowstorm through the space-time transfer. It's likely that the snow had gotten into the reader then and had frozen over from the cold afterward. Even here at Alsagi Island, the weather was fine, but it didn't change the fact that the temperature was still low. On top of that, it was right before dawn, the coldest part of the day. I warmed my numb fingers with my breath. I turned my coat collar up, shrugged in my neck, and scuffled my feet. My smoke-like breath stayed adrift in the cold air. I angrily tried to insert the card again. I tried it over and over, hoping that the heat from the friction would melt the ice. I just couldn't give up here. Nothing would begin if I didn't get out of Sphere's circle. No matter what happened, I had to leave the gate before the next transfer. If I didn't, I wouldn't be able to save everyone in the shelter cabin. Shit! Go in, I'm begging you! In one last effort, I shoved the card into the slot with all my might. It... it went in. The t only the tip managed to slip in. There was no need for hesitation. Using all my body weight, I forced the card to slide through. Yeah, I love these little 3D animation bits. Ah, <sighs> don't scare me like that. The left and right doors to the gate opened with a thunderous roar. I tried to pull out the card and leave. But, huh? It wouldn't move. The card was stuck. It wouldn't come out. If I didn't remove it, the gate would never close. Jeez. I could use my entire body weight to force it in, but not for pulling it out. My fingertips were slippery from the numbing cold, so I couldn't even grip the card properly. And time was cruelly passing by. There's no choice. Guess I'll have to leave it. No matter how hard I try, what well, won't come out won't come out. There's no help in it. Just getting the gate open was good enough. I abandoned the ID card and stepped into the outside world. I don't know if that's a good idea, Mean. The coastline appeared. Only the sound of the waves silently drifted through the air. I couldn't hear anything beside that. It was an extremely quiet night. There were 10 minutes left until the next transfer. I had nothing to do but focus and keep waiting. To eagerly wait for that time to come. The distance from here to Sphere's front gate wasn't very far. Close enough that it would take only a minute to get there if I ran at full speed. I could still clearly see the tall circular wall around the building from here. The moon's light reflected dimly off the wall's surface. It had a dignified shine in the darkness. I couldn't imagine something that big being able to transfer. It looked so sturdy, almost impossible to move or vanish. I even felt like it would stubbornly refuse to move no matter what. Is this transfer really going to happen? After reaching this point, uncertainty began to cross my mind. Even so, there was nothing I could do but wait. Seven minutes to go before the next transfer. I thought I was keeping my cool, but you know what? The body doesn't lie about these things. As time passed, the intervals between my heartbeats became shorter. I couldn't feel the cold anymore. My palms were sweating even though I was only standing. I felt like I was choking from the pressure. If I messed this up, there'd be no second chances. Kokoro, Yumoki, and Lin would all be caught in an avalanche and die. My heart was beating like crazy. Along with the excitement, I felt a great feeling of exhilaration from the bottom of my chest. Five minutes to go. The passage of time felt exceedingly slow. I was so frustrated I couldn't stand still. I walked aimlessly along the sandy beach as the waves lapped at its edge. This is going to be interesting. A gust of wind blew past me. Before the wind finished blowing, Sphere's figure suddenly disappeared, and as though changing places with it, a brown plain without much snow appeared. Without a thunderous roar and without a brilliant flash of light, it happened silently, without a sound, 
like turning a single page in a book. Because that mysterious spectacle had occurred right before my eyes, I fell into a trance-like state. I stood dumbfounded without understanding what had happened. If we were standing part way in, part way out, would it have sliced us in half? Just out of curiosity. <laughs> Only time steadily continued. The sound of the waves gradually returned to my ears. I glanced up at the night sky, at the eternal light cast by the countless stars and the waning moon. Nothing had changed. The world continued as usual around me. However, when I lowered my eyes, a strange scene was waiting for me. The brown earth was spread out as if drawn in a big, big circle. It wasn't an illusion. Even when I blinked and swayed my head, the scene wouldn't disappear. Was that... a transfer? The situation finally sunk in, but even then my senses didn't clear. My ears were picking up a sound like light breathing nearby. Coming in between the crashing of the waves, they resounded as though burying the silence. That's right. What am I doing? I... I have to hurry. I started to walk unsteadily, as though being pulled. My awkward steps gradually began to un adjust their pace. Eventually that turned into quick walking and then a trot and finally into a sprint that cut through the darkness. Current time, 5.02am. I stepped into the circle. That zone was a barren wasteland of brown rock. Even though I say wasteland, the ground felt damp. I stopped running and touched the earth's surface. A damp sensation was transmitted to my finger. The bottom of my leather shoes slid over the bare rock, which was gently coated with moisture. Paying attention to the surface under my feet, I broke into a run. The place I was aiming for was the circle's core. However, what was there wasn't a shelter cabin made of wood, but a structure plastered in pure white. What does this mean? Where is this? After reaching it, I took a breath and immediately began looking around the structure. It was a cube, its length and height being five meters each. It looked like a large six-sided dice. Of course, there wasn't anything like numbers or the alphabet carved into the sides. On three of the four sides, there was nothing like a window or anything sticking out, but there was a ladder attached to the last side. Made out of iron pipes, they continued up to the roof. I climbed it. A square rooftop. There wasn't anything like a fence set up around it. The only thing there was a round door, painted in green. The small iron door was like a manhole cover, hidden in the corner of the roof. There was a handle on it. I tried to lift it, but it wouldn't budge. Looking closely, I saw a keyhole like groove carved near the handle. A keyhole? I remembered right away. About the key in my pocket. The one I hadn't known the use of before. The key I found in my room on the 12th. It was placed next to the ID card. An extremely ordinary and simple key. No way. Despite my doubts, I had to check it anyway. I took it out of my pocket and tried to fill it in. Fit it in, sorry. It, it went in. As if being inhaled, the key smoothly settled inside the hole. I tried turning it. With a pleasant metal sound, the lock released itself with no resistance. Are you serious? It unlocked it. The round green door. I opened it without hesitation. The inside gleamed with a white light. The inside was as bright as day. I squinted from the overwhelming light. While shielding my eyes with one hand, I took a look inside the room. There wasn't even a shadow. No one was around. There was a ladder leading down from the round entrance. I climbed down it. With a great creaking of its hinges, the door closed. The inside was saturated in a bright white. Because light shone from every direction, no shadows existed inside the room. This scene, where all shade was lost, warped my sense of perspective. Where did the walls begin and end? What were the limits of the ceiling? How far did the floor extend? I couldn't understand it all. It felt like I was floating completely isolated in the middle of white space. Only the sensation in the soles of my feet made me sure that I was, I was touching the floor. When I looked up, the door had vanished. The inside of the door was likely painted white as well. Lost in the light, I couldn't even find its outline. I didn't even know where the ladder was. The whole surface was a pure white world, where the notion of depth no longer existed. There was, however, a lone black object. A round object that pierced the center of the round space like a hull. Fumbling around, I made my, my way through the light and neared the hull. When I reached out one figure to touch it, I felt my hand touch the surface. The round black object wasn't really a hull, but a sphere. A little bigger than a soccer ball. It had absolutely no luster, so it just looked like a black hole, sucking up all the surrounding light. I tried patting it with the palm of my hand. It was completely smooth to the touch, offering no resistance at all. It was held slightly below my vision, my line of vision. At first, I thought it was floating, but then I realized it was just hanging down from the ceiling suspended by a chain. What the heck is this? Incomprehensible. And moreover, where the hell was I? Where did the shelter cabin disappear to? 
Once again, I fumbled forward into the light. Almost immediately, I ran up against a wall. Judging from the feeling against the palm of my hand, I could tell that the surface of the wall was curved. Apparently, the structure was in the shape of a dome. It was a cube from the outside, but it was it's a hemisphere inside. I walked along the wall for a while. My knee hit something. When I concentrated hard, I looked around within the light and was able to make out a bed lying there. Every surface of the bed was painted white. It had a simplicity that reminded me of an old hospital. A bed? Someone lives here? But I couldn't see a blanket or pillows. Not even sheets on the mattress. Not lives. Not lives, but lived. The bed, the stairs, the sphere. It seems like there's nothing here aside from that. Present time, 5.21pm. Suddenly I heard a deep rumbling from outside. Almost like an earthquake. That sound instantly brought me back to reality. That's right. I had to get to the shelter cabin. No sense in hanging around here forever. Groping for the ladder, I finally managed to grab a hold of the rung. As the sound of clanging iron resounded in the while, in the white, I climbed up. When the ladder came to an end, I extended an arm toward the ceiling. This feeling of iron, it's the door. I tried pushing up against it. It didn't move. It didn't budge a millimeter. Even when I tried to force it open with my shoulders, it didn't give in the slightest. I immediately started searching for the keyhole, but it was nowhere to be found. D don't tell me. I'm locked in. I tried ramming into it over and over, but the results were always the same. This is bad. Very bad. Impatience assailed me. I had to get out of here right away, but there's nothing I could do. Finally, I lost my grip and fell to the floor. There must be a way. Isn't there another way out? I desperately looked for other exits, but it was useless. The bed, the ladder, the sphere, there was nothing other than that. Meanwhile, time was mercilessly advancing. Yeah, we're stuck inside the circle now. We're going to transfer and we're going to be stuck here. All of a sudden, the door opened. Someone was climbing down the ladder. The one who came down... The one who came down was... Inamoto? In a moment, I was thrown into chaos. Why? Why is Inamoto here? This guy, isn't he supposed to be dead? Once he noticed I was there, shock registered on Inamoto's face. We glared at each other, neither moving a muscle. The one who finally broke the silence was him. You! Who are you? Huh? Didn't you hear me? I asked you who uh, who are you? Answer me! I didn't understand. Shouldn't Inamoto know who I am? Why doesn't he recognize me? Answer me. Inamoto repeated. Reluctantly, I decided to answer. I'm... My name is... Yukido Satoru. What? Inamoto panicked. No, it wasn't anything as simple as panic. It was a horrified dismay, as though the world was crumbling down around him. At his wit's end, staggering, he wrung a groan out of his convulsing throat. Uh, what? What, what, what? You scum, you dare you call yourself Yukido Satoru? Yeah. Is there anything wrong with that? His eyes pierced me, and those eyes had detected intense hatred and rage. You scum. If you say you're Yukido Satoru... Now I see. Saying this, Inamoto's face darkened. While tapping on his temples, he continued muttering. What a state of affairs. If scum like you could get in here. It's all ruined. The project is a failure. Even though I... Damn, it's so stupid. I feel like throwing up. What are you saying? I can't understand you at all. But Inamoto continued without answering my question. Well, whatever. And though I say I failed, it all, really, all it really means is that one possibility has collapsed. The number of possibilities of worlds in existence is infinite. It's simple. I can also say that another world... In another world, we didn't fail. As long as I just keep myself together, it won't end with a pathetic result like this. I'm different from low-life scum like you. Absolutely. A result as stupid and worthless as you absolutely will not come to be. And I'm going to spat that out, still glaring at me. What are you saying? It's the many worlds interpretation. The many worlds interpretation? The meaning of those words. Yes, we already know that. Infinite universes, blah, blah, blah. Every time we make a decision, it spawns a new universe. Come on. All right, all right. We're going to wrap this one up here. And uh, we'll come back to the explanation of the next one. Might be the last episode next time. I don't know. I don't know, but uh, I'm curious to know what the fuck is going on. And wrap everything up. Looking forward to it. Thanks for watching first. I'll see you in the next one.